Hey everybody, this is Rob Tiffany for your IoT Minute. Today I'm going to talk about something that some of you might think is controversial and others might think, wow, this is just plain old common sense. The premise of today's talk is, can the web save IoT? You probably think the IoT doesn't need any savings. I mean, you know, after all, it's the biggest megatrend in the world today. Uh, ever since McKinsey told everybody it's going to be an $11 trillion opportunity and Cisco told you there's going to be 50 billion devices connected in the next few years, everybody's been all in on IoT. Um, but as far as broad success is concerned, we still have a failure to launch, Houston. Um, we've got some wins here and there, but it's still isolated. And why is that? Well. A lot of people think IoT is just still too complicated. It requires too many skill sets, too much domain knowledge, too many things across too many disciplines. Uh, and so that's, what the, that's what's holding it back for a lot of people. So while a lot of my techie friends that I've worked with for years and years who know about how to do all this hard stuff <laughs> might want to flame me, um, I have a viewpoint that's kind of more focused on the business end of things. You need to get stuff done and you need it to be as easy as possible because you want that value from those IoT use cases. You want to save money. You want to make money. You want to reduce risk. You want to increase safety for your employees. You want to improve customer service. There's all those things you want to do with IoT and having it be the domain of some techie guys is just not going to work for you. So what can we do about that? I think sometimes good enough is good enough. And I think the web is good enough. Obviously, since Tim Berners-Lee cranked out the World Wide Web in the early 90s, it's taken off like no other technology before it. It's easy to use. Uh, it's easy to find things. You know, It's easy to program. And I think IoT should be the exact same way. So I'm going to just walk you through a few things uh, to show you how you can use all the different components of the World Wide Web. Uh, and, and it's kind of ecosystem partners uh, to build IoT today. And I think you'll find that, yeah, it, it's more than good enough to meet your needs. So let's start off with transports. You know, a lot of people in IoT are consumed with, you know, things like MQTT and AMQP to do transporting stuff around uh, in a broad sense. There's absolutely nothing wrong with HTTP and REST. Yeah, do the purists think it's not as efficient? Maybe it's not as bandwidth friendly. Maybe it's not as battery friendly. Sure, they might be right. But we're just talking about little things here. We're not, it's not in a big way. I say ubiquity of HTTP trumps all that other stuff. And so I'm going to go with ubiquity and rest. Because the reality is the most powerful, most scalable performance systems on the planet today are all based on HTTP. And that's good enough for me. If Facebook can serve 2 billion people every day, I think your systems will be just fine with REST. So I'm not going to sweat it. Um, let's talk about data formats. And I apologize if I keep looking down. I've got my little cheat sheet over here. Um, data formats. JSON, JavaScript object notation, has become the de facto standard of how we send data around the internet. Why is that? Well, it's because it's easy. It was, comes out of JavaScript. It takes objects that we use in programming and serializes them. That's just a serialization is just a geeky way of saying here's how we're going to send stuff as text over the internet over REST calls, uh, and then turn it back to objects on the other side. It works everywhere. It'll work in any browser, any programming language. It's an easy way to do formats. Are there lots of other web formats you could use? Absolutely. I totally believe IoT should be as easy as the web. So it could be XML, like the good old days. I remember when we used to think XML was going to take over the world. Um, it could be name value pairs. Anytime you've been in your web browser and you posted data, you sent name value pairs of data over. You can use that too. Anything you should be able to do in a browser should work for you in IoT uh, and going over HTTP. So that should be no biggie. So JSON should be your default format. It's something that everyone understands and everyone can connect over HTTP. URLs are a great thing. I know you don't think a lot about it. That's when you type in in the browser. How do I go to a web page? Using URLs is a great way to have a data source. If I need to get data to pull down, I can reach out to that and get that data. And if I need to send data somewhere, URL is a great way to do it. It's uh, I can post it, you know, or I can do name value pair gets. Easy way to post data. If you think of IoT devices sending telemetry, absolutely. 
this is an easy way to do it. URLs is how you find things. URLs is how we create, you know, a distributed system, you know, different nodes in an IoT system, you know. Use URLs, you know, URIs to find things. It's a great way to do it, and it's easy, and everybody understands it. So what's next? JavaScript. JavaScript is the programming language of the web. I know there's lots of programming languages on the web, on the server side and all over the place, but nothing is even close to as pervasive. It got built into the browser, you know, back in the Netscape days in the 90s uh, to run things on the client side. Netscape actually is who brought it to the server side too with their first web servers. You know, today on the server side, people use something called Node.js uh, to do server side JavaScript. And then they use all kinds of cool JavaScript frameworks on the client side to build stuff. JavaScript can be the logic of your IoT system. It can power IoT servers, platforms. It can provide the business logic for rules, filtering, stuff like that. Is it going to be for everything? Absolutely not. But it's so easy and so many people can understand and get their head around JavaScript. And it can absolutely, you know, when I think of how easy JavaScript is, you know, I spend a lot of time teaching kids. You know, you might have heard Code.org and the, uh, the Hour of Code where you have these puzzle pieces and it teaches kids how to think and logics and loops and branching and things like that. And it's all JavaScript under the hood uh, just by putting puzzle pieces together. JavaScript is absolutely the best choice for your primary logic, for your, for your, your IoT on the web. Can you use other languages for machine learning and other stuff for more advanced stuff? Absolutely. Go with Python. Turns out Python is also one of the easiest languages to learn, and it's becoming more and more the choice of data scientists everywhere, uh, even surpassing R, which is good. I'm a fan of easy and getting the job done, so Python's cool. JavaScript for your filtering and business logic. Python for your machine learning, more data science kind of stuff. Sounds easy to me. Um, security. How do we do security? Well, how do we do it today? You know, we use something called SSL. It's called TLS these days. You know, the padlock on your browser? That's how we encrypt a tunnel of data sending from devices up to your platform uh, on your IoT system, just like you do on the web today. So that creates an encrypted tunnel. How do we authenticate devices? Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Probably the easiest way to do it, you know, it's got a few different names, the kind of token-based authentication, I've heard it called API keys, shared access, security tokens, things like that. But it's basically every ID, every uh, device has a unique ID, and then it has its own unique security token. That could be a globally, you know, unique identifier, uh, could be a generated random number, something like that. Uh, that's an easy way to do it. Uh, just make sure you rotate those, uh, create new keys, you know, new uh, tokens for these devices more frequently. Uh, so they don't stick around. It's a great way to authenticate them for machines. Obviously, you can do more advanced things like X509 certificates, client cert. Again, these are all the these are all web-based concepts though that are in use today everywhere. This is nothing new. Um, for people, OAuth. OAuth is how we uh, do authentication for people today. You probably use it without even knowing it. Every time you know use a social media site uh, like Facebook or otherwise to say, this is who I am, and to authenticate you for other systems. You can absolutely use that for people who are using your IoT platform to administer it, to run reports, things like that. Uh, things can use tokens. People can use tokens too if you want to. Anyway, great easy ways to do this stuff all using web technologies. How do you do visualization? HTML5 is your friend, and JavaScript, and all these fun, easy, free widgets out there. Uh, to do charts and graphs and all kinds of other visualizations to see what's going on with your machines, your IoT stuff. HTML5 is your best choice for visualization. But it doesn't have to be limited to that. Make sure your platform and all the technology you have is totally wrapped in REST APIs. Those APIs over HTTP I talked about that are using JSON. If you expose every function and everything your system can do in REST APIs, not only can those APIs power HTML5 user interfaces that work on any browser on any device. But if you want to build native apps for your Android or your iPhone or stuff like that, or your iPads or your PCs, MacBooks, go for it. Use those APIs to build those native apps. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy stuff. Not a problem. Some people say, well, how am I going to do command and control over HTTP? Well, I'll give you a few different ways. The easiest way, but maybe not the most efficient, is checking for something. It's called polling. 
every maybe every time you send telemetry over HTTP your your connection, you check with your server and you say, hey, you got anything for me? Uh, and if you do, you download it. Um, that's not the most efficient way to do it, but that's the quick and dirty way. Um, you know, way back when, you know, time I spent at Microsoft, we created something called Exchange Active Sync, which used something called long polling. You know, basically for devices to get their email and have email pushed to them. You're kind of making a connection with the server and leaving it open for a while, for, uh, and then events can be pushed from the server down. Uh, long polling mechanisms are out there that you can do today. Uh, but there's also a W3C standard in HTML5 called WebSockets you can use for command and control. Uh, and so this, again, this is a, a device initiated thing, so you're not listening. I never advocate ever browsing or being able to go interrogate an in-device. It should always make outbound only connections, but it can create that initial connection and then use WebSockets. And then that's, and WebSockets are super efficient and then servers can send messages down to the device. So if you need to do command and control to change the configuration of a device, a thing, your machine, or change its runtime behavior, or as a basis to do device management. If you need to update its software or firmware, you can use WebSockets for that. Moving forward, there's also a new-ish standard called HTTP2, which actually has been around since 2015. This is way better than the current HTTP 1.1 we're currently using, which is kind of text-based and a one-way thing. With HTTP2, uh, you go from text to binary, so it gets even more efficient uh, as far as bandwidth and battery life. Uh, and you, it also has server push. So being able to push stuff to devices over HTTP 2 will probably negate the need for WebSockets in the future. Uh, so all that's a good thing. Speaking about bandwidth efficiency, what's another web technology you can use that's pervasive to help bandwidth? Use gzip. So when your devices are sending telemetry, use gzip to make sure you compress that JSON that you're sending up. And you can use gzip on the way down as well. Um, let's see, is there anything I've left out? I'm sure I've left out tons of stuff here. I'm looking at my quick list here. You know, when you think of that server side part of your IoT platform, if it's all web-based, it's like a web server. You know, make sure you're using a firewall. Make sure it's limiting IP address ranges. Again, make sure you have a way to authenticate stuff coming in. Uh, make sure you're using TLS, stuff like that. We've got a wide range of technologies out there that you already use today. It's easy to use. They're all around you. So just pick those things up and use it for IoT today. You don't have to do it the hard way. Yeah, there might be some edge cases you might miss out on, but I think the big value is there for the taking. So go for it. I think the web can save IoT. I'm out.